Well, welcome everyone. My name is Maria Gastambide and I am Director and Chief Curator of Public Art of the University of Houston System, one of the oldest and most significant university public art collections in the United States. I am so happy that you are joining us today for the fourth On-Site Off-Site, a monthly series of conversations with artists in our collection. Part of public art's effort to recast our public programs into a virtual and far-reaching realm in the series, we check in with our artists to discuss a wide range of topics from public art broadly to their commissions at the University of Houston system, to their changing studio practice, and of course, to life under COVID and um, increased demands for social justice. Before diving in, let's take, a, like, to take care of a few housekeeping issues. We've planned a 45 minute conversation followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session at the end. For our participants, you'll notice that there is a Q&A box. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the conversation, but we will take care of as, as many questions as we can at the end of the conversation. And we're also setting aside some time um, towards the end also for feedback. Joining me today are Floyd Newsom and Bert Samples. Thank you both for inviting us into your homes and studios. We really appreciate it, especially in this kind of weird moment, the, the, the calm before the storm, so to speak, as we kind of brace or wait for, for Hurricane Laura. I'm delighted to be here. Me too. A Memphis-born but longtime Houstonian, Floyd Newsom is a visual artist whose career spans more than four decades. Although he is primarily a painter, Floyd is also an accomplished draftman and printmaker, and he has had several important public art commissions, including the four-part Contemplating Success from 2004 at the University of Houston downtown, where he, is, um, where he has been a professor of art for many years. And um, I'm showing you here the four parts of this wonderful work. His work is characterized by a contrast of a naive style and serious subject matter centering on cultural climate, political statements, and world events. And this combination lends a, lends a very interesting multidimensional quality to his work. Here is, uh, we also wanted to share an image of another one of his major public art commissions, and it is Planter and Stems from 2003, at um, in downtown Houston. Bert Samples is, um, was born and based in Houston. He trained at Texas Southern University under J Dr. John Biggers and Kermit Oliver. Can you all see my, 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 my slides? I cannot see anything. Okay. This is not coming up right now. Let me check. Let me check on that. I'm, I apologize. Is that better? Nope. Nothing's changed. Okay. Give me one sec. And a lot of text, no change. Okay. Give me one second. I'm going to change. I'm going to change, um, share my screen again. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you see now? Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There we go. It's all good, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let me just um, backtrack a moment and show Floyd's images again. These are the four. This is. These are the four elements of the four-part series. Contemplating Success from 2004 at um, UH Downtown um, in each of the four floors of the Commerce Street building. And this is another major um, public art commission, Planter and Stems from 2003 in downtown Houston. And then here we go. So we'll start again, start afresh with Bert. Bert, as I mentioned, was born and based in Houston. He trained at Texas Southern University, or TSU, under Dr. John Biggers and Kermit Oliver and other foundational figures in Houston's African-American art scene, and later pursued graduate studies here at, at UH. 
Bert has had a long, um, long career, and he's been concerned for most of that career with making deeper connections with exploring rituals, myths, and dreams with music, and particularly with building community. Public art is fortunate to have two of Bert's works in the collection, an early painting from 1980, and the site-specific glass piece, Manu Langitly Stares Songs in the Grip of Shadow and Light from 2011 at UHD. And let me show you a few, few images of this magnificent work, and here are some details. Bert is also, I might add, a conservation technician at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, where um, I had the pleasure of first meeting him and becoming his colleague. In 1993, Floyd and Bert helped to establish Project Row Houses, along with Rick Lowe, James Bettison, Bert Long Jr., Jesse Lott, and George Smith in Houston's historic Third Ward. Nearly 30 years later, Project Row Houses is now a national social practice model addressing cultural, educational, and social issues in the community. So we thought we would, um, oh, and I wanted to just also show you details of um, a major work at the Houston Intercontinental Airport, um, patches, passages one, two, three, and four, also in glass, and it is very much foundational for the work that Bert later developed at UHD. So I wanted to begin by asking you both, or spending a moment with you both discussing the works in our collection. Your commissions for public art are both large scale, they affect the architecture, the mood, and even the color of the spaces they inhabit. Floyd, your artwork contemplating success is um, a series of bright and colorful narrative paintings full of symbols, one on each floor of the Commerce Street building. Themes of university life and student advancement through education are evident in that work. Can you talk us through some of the repeating symbolism, like the stairs and ladders? And second, as an artist, but also a professor of art, tell us about what you want to want these works to communicate. What do you hope your students will take away from them? Well, first of all, uh, when I came up with the imagery, I wanted to do something thought provoking, something that would address uh, student success. Uh, you know, my, my institution, uh, UH Downtown, as I think one of the largest, uh, well, the largest population of that campus is Hispanic, uh, more than 50%. And so I incorporated some Spanish words in, in, the, uh, in the compositions. But what I wanted to do with, with everyone was to, to say that they could succeed. And the latter, which has been a symbol of mine for many years, is uh, because of my father being a firefighter. Uh, was a sense of hope, uh, rescue, ascension. Stairs can be looked upon the same way. But then there's those, those floating symbols that, that symbols that could suggest that uh, you know, there is no limits. You can, you can reach to the sky and beyond. Uh, and in doing this, I wanted to be colorful because I wanted, to, and then I'm always one about color anyway, but I wanted to be exciting. I wanted to be intriguing. I wanted to to, to evoke some emotions. And uh, that, that, was, that was really the, the premise. And uh, working with the architect, uh, they had suggested that, we, that, that, that it be set inside the, the wall and they placed it in such an angle so that when we're on top of the bridge and, and the building is below the bridge at night, those colors just, just radiate uh, in four different areas of that building. It becomes very exciting, uh, not only in day, but, but at night, it's just sort of a, uh, a beautiful uh, uh, array of colors that sort of pulsate uh, from, from, from that building. Thank you. Bert, so tell us um, about the materials you used to create Manu. 
it's five, as I understand it, you made it out of five double layer panels of etched dichroic glass, which it's unfortunate that we cannot fully capture the magic of this piece with, with images, but it basically shifts color depending on where you are in relation to the piece. Why did you choose glass and why, what did you achieve by layering it? What does that medium mean to you, both in terms of the process in the studio and also what it communicates with the viewer? Well, the key, there are several key things that initiated this project. One was that uh, they had already did uh, the piece at the Intercontinental Airport, which is also in the medium of glass, etched glass, uh, with several layers of etched patterns on top of each other and goblets of glass there, but it lacked color. And that was the prompt thing that when I was approached by the Downtown University of Houston in Florida, I think it was very instrumental in working on that. And uh, so this, the, the beginning of the process is to work with the same materials, but added color. And uh, I was working with the same fabricators out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And I was wrestling with how to add color, either use dyes or things like that. But then I finally got a email from one of the recent installation they did in downtown uh, uh, Lexington, uh, Louisville, rather, sorry. And uh, they introduced this uh, film called Diachronic Film that was in, created by NASA for shielding the astronauts from harsh light from the sun. And it had this kind of uh, reflectiveness that Bends with with uh, bends light like color does when you see things like all in a resin of water or or, or just light or, or just a spectrum of light how it bends and so as you walk from one side to the other the light is shifting from from the other mm -hmm. now it's prophetic according to the title. Man who languidly stirs songs into the grips of shadow and light. I created this piece because it was commissioned for the expansion of the W.R. Dykes Library. And so I had in mind of doing something that would reflect something worldly like an old world atlas of how the early maps were designed, of how the, they viewed how the world looked to them at that time. And you can see a lot of distortions of what we know how the Earth looks today, and particularly from looking from the satellites. But the word Manu is, very, is a linchpin to this whole thing because in researching it, it seemed like the word Manu kept changing its meaning over time. And it's prophetic that we're talking about this now because the early roots of what I think Mano refers to is either Noah or the Great Flood. Mm -hmm. And so when you research the word Manu in different cultures and you reference it to an epic flood, which most civilizations probably have, uh, Manu is a word that comes up in some form of nature, some one way of the nature. And so Houston is very synonymous with a lot of flooding. And uh, downtown University of Houston is right next to uh, uh, Buffalo Bayou. Mm -hmm. And so when I was talking to the committee about that, you know, I was talking about some of the earliest ways of people migrating to Houston. And probably one of the early ones is by, by boat down the bayou. And, you know, you can look out the window, at least at time before when I was built, this, there was a window that could look out onto the uh, I-10 freeway. You could see mm -hmm. the bayou and you can see the railroad going through. And all those are very, you know, kind of portals, a lot of trails to take you into Houston and out going from east to west. So, uh, so working with that and then using some of the, the same uh, processes that I did with uh, uh, the the uh, passages piece in the airport, 
I was the way to view this is looking at it from many perspectives, from looking up from the sky, from the ground up to the sky. And because Houston is mainly flat, so you can see a lot of the horizon, a lot of sky, and studying the cloud formations, how they shift in. And I think that's what we'll be doing a lot uh, in the next couple of 48 hours to see how the clouds is going to be shifting around. <laughs> You know, and sometimes we rely on our instincts of like, oh, this is coming our way, maybe it's not coming our way. And it's an interesting transition of trusting what you see from the outside or studying the radar of what the meteorologists are telling you what they say is coming. You know, they have a greater standpoint of looking at things from a satellite and they're getting certain type of us, other type of instrumentation. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's, a, there's a link between the early navigators who took sail on ships and to even now of what what you learn by looking up at the sky and studying different patterns of light. And that's the other commonality. No matter what I've worked on, light is a consistent material that I refer to, whether it's paint or glass, you know, or uh, any other medium that I may, may be working with. And so uh, we've seen things and uh, things that take on the form of clouds, but also it's also these kind of uh, biomorphic shapes that take place when chemicals are shifting, you know, like in a pool of a, in a swamp or, or just how, you know, how early uh, where geologists, how they studied the earth of how mm -hmm. the earth is and seeing certain color patterns and rings of you know, what was happening with the Earth at this point and, and how we're predicting what happens with us, you know, in the future, the way, you know, the, the increase of, of, of weather patterns are hitting us on a, a more increasing nature. And sort so, of like a primeval sort of um, substance that moves around and changes depending our, on, on where we are relative to it. Exactly. And people can read, you know, your people can read the future by reading tea leaves and, mm -hmm. and looking at things in the class because there's certain things that suggest from their, well, their internal uh, uh, gestures and remarks and experience that leads them to think of things in a certain way. And so uh, this is things that I think are suggestive, but it's one central thing that I put in there is somewhat of a serpent. Now, a serpent is always viewed in mythology as either good or bad. And in most of the Western culture, this has a more darker part of vision. Mm -hmm. But I took uh, the element of what called the, uh, the uh, ancient Mesoamerica cultures, Quetzalcoatl, mm -hmm. which refers to uh, the feathery serpent. Mm -hmm you know, a serpent with wings. And then in Asian, uh, Eastern, you have serpent, uh, dragon, if you will, serpent, dragon. And some have taken flight, some remain in the sky and never touch ground. And so, you know, I'm touching on different, you know, patterns of, of folklore with cultures that can't see, that is looking beyond what is what has appeared to be invisible, but, but it's very believable in their minds and souls. Well, and relatable to everyone. And that's, that's the one thing, not only about UHD, but about many of our universities within the system, that they are a complete sort of panoply of cultures and they come together in our campuses. And I think you capture that, that beautifully, that's feeling beautifully. I wanted to, I know this is um, something that is very, at least interesting to me. You spent your formational period at TSU, trained um, under, like I said, Dr. Biggers and also Kermit Oliver. I thought, I thought it would be very interesting to others who have joined us today, if you could talk to us briefly about that experience. And here I am showing a beautiful mural that we have also at UHD by, by Dr. Biggers. Um, the title is Salt Marsh. And you mentioned, Bert, this idea of the campus being sort of in the um, 
in the ways of some of Houston historic waterways. And this, these are some of the reference that Dr. Biggers also incorporates into his mural. So what was that like, training under these larger than life figures? Exactly that. It was, I, I, was, I had a simple uh, aspiration of what I was or who I was gonna be, you know. You know, getting out of high school, I don't know how I survived that. That was some of the patterns that, that lived in most people's lives, particularly African-American lives, you know. It, you don't know who's going to be with you once you get through one phase of life to the next. And so it was a survival for me to get into college. And so I didn't know much about it, but I know that my uh, mother always encouraged me to, to draw and I used to help her with her, her bulletin boards for her fall and spring semesters. And uh, uh, they sent me right into that and I discovered the art department very early on and learning the, the, already the, the legendary nature of Dr. Biggers and Kara Sims and the decades of students that followed, that went to this program and, and uh, uh, and seeing, wow, what I had stumbled into, but I also have to point out is that when I was there, uh, that was was working on a, a major mural, and I like to point out the, the key figures that you see on screen right now of these figures with these heads that are broken in geometric patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first time I saw him utilize that type of uh, direction in this piece, moving from more less figurative into things that are geometric. That he was taking many clues from, from African sculpture, which he has collected heavily after being traveled to Africa on several occasions. And this way of thinking and language was just uh, bicameral in a sense where things that we knew from, you know, our history in this country in a folklore sense, and then the translation of that into what is very recognizable in African, African everyday life and history, uh, in the language, in the music, you know, in the architecture, you know, and all those things were like a renaissance where they're awakening for me. Mm -hmm. And it was just, just being quiet and just observing during those years. Thank you. Yeah, putting it's almost like putting into words this ancestral knowledge that you don't recognize you have, but when you see it in such a meaningful and beautiful way, you you instantly recognize it. Yeah, Floyd. And I appreciate that you brought you brought this. You're using this this work as your your background because we <laughs> wanted to spend spend a few moments talking about it. Um, <laughs> there's many backstories to this work. I don't know if you want to go into all those details, but I'll I'll maybe we should because they're they're quite fun. But let me just ask one question, and then maybe we could go into the the more lighthearted aspects of this commission. Um, so you have experience creating art for the public realm, not just that, uh, not just with um, this work, but also with our works at UHD and others. And, and we're thinking, um, we're thinking about uh, this sculptural commission as well. Um, is your process and approach as an artist different for a commission intended for a public setting versus your more traditional um, two-dimensional works or paintings? Well, I try to combine both. Uh, I want to make sure that the, the, uh, the client or, or the collector, when I'm doing public art, that I, I'm sensitive toward what they think or imagine uh, that they would like to see, and I would also, and I also incorporate some of my own, you know, uh, symbols. So with this particular piece, this was my first sculpture commission, and actually it was, I didn't think I was going to get it because uh, I got a, it was it was uh, one of the uh, 
uh, projects for, uh, at that time, Houston, Houston um, Arts Alliance, I believe, Arts, Cultural Arts Council is what it was called, Houston Cultural Arts Council. And so I didn't apply. And then I got a phone call saying that uh, I should apply. I said, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a painter, not a sculptor. He said, yeah, but you like color. So I said, okay, I'll try. And, and so I, uh, we, had a, we had a meeting with uh, Stephen Fox, who's, you know, noted historian, uh, worked at Rice. And with the other two artists, uh, we, we were meeting with Stephen and he was telling us the history of, of downtown or how it developed. And something said to me, you know, maybe I should think about what he just said. You know, uh, it's, it's going to be on Main Street. It's, it's for uh, the Super Bowl. This was 2002, 2003. And so I went to, uh, to the library down, downtown and started researching the Houston, the Houston uh, development uh, um, and the characters involved, the Abercrombies, the Jones, uh, the Browns. And, 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 and then I, I discovered uh, uh, some of the, the smaller uh, uh, figures that were, were not as rich or maybe they weren't rich at all. But uh, one was an Irishman, one was Hispanic, and one was African American, and um, they became uh, a focal point for me. So the planter represents uh, those uh, entrepreneurs, those developers who would meet, and I think they were called the Gang of Eight, and they would meet uh, downtown at, at a hotel to decide the direction of Houston. Uh, and then uh, some of the smaller uh, entrepreneurs, uh, I use the stems as as a way of of approaching approaching their contribution. And so, I when it was first put up, it was sort of it was broke it was broken up. And I I I asked in the beginning that that uh, it all be put in one. In, in one group, but they wanted to they wanted to um, involve three blocks. So, uh, fifteen years later, they wanted to restore it, and so I, I demanded that that it not be on three blocks; that it be on one, mm -hmm. and that they all be together. And so, uh, I added two more stems, but in in the in the uh, in the in in the different forms, there, there are silhouettes of the Astrodome, Penn's Oil, there's representation of water like White Oak, White Oak Bayou, Buffalo Bayou, which, you know, they, they, they surround U of H downtown in a sense. Uh, there were uh, different, different marks uh, that suggested uh, uh, the street and, and just, just variety of, of symbols that I thought would, would help to um, make it interesting and and uh, so when I when I when I was doing this, I had this beautiful model, and thinking that I was not going to win, and I got this phone call saying that they wanted to hire me as 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 the artist for the project. I almost died. I had, I said I can make a model. So I was just, I was just saying to myself. I didn't say it to them, but now I had to make. The real thing. The real deal. Yeah, I called. I called. The, I called the late John Scott in New Orleans and said, "Florida, I'll work with you through the from the from the from right now until you finish it." And he did. And and I, but I also called and went to visit uh, the late Luis Luis uh, Hernandez, mm -hmm. who was teaching at UH uh, a semester a year, and so I went to his apartment and. Luis talked talk, talk to me about paint, about the kind of paint I should use and make sure I have a sealer. And, and so he helped, he helped also. And so um, he face to face and, and John Scott long distance on the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was, that was, so that was my first major uh, uh, commission. Now I've done uh, several here in one in Fort Worth and, and, uh, who knows what else I, I might do, but um, 
it was it was almost a heart attack coming, <laughs> but it actually was a big blessing. And uh, so now, not only do I paint and do prints and draw, but I, I also do sculptures. You do them very well. well. Thank you. So, so that communal communal spirit, that spirit that kind of carried you through this first process, brings me to another um, another topic that I, that we thought would be great to discuss. Um, because we have you both here with us, and that is Project Row Houses. Mm -hmm. So 27 years ago in 1993, you were two of seven visionary artists that founded um, the institution, which is a community platform based in Houston's Third Ward, whose mission is to create sustainable opportunities and enrich lives of those in under-resourced communities through collective and creative action of course project row houses needs not no introduction for those of you who are joining from houston but we're if you're joining from outside of houston we would encourage you to take a look at their programs and activities they are just um, an explosion of creativity and the impetus behind massive waves of development in houston's historic third ward yeah so so floyd and bert what if you could tell us what were some of the um what was the experience of starting project row houses as a collective what was the impetus and what was the first project you embarked on together so share that share that with us i remember when i got to houston i was told to meet two people and this is before the group i was told to meet john biggers and george kraus and and so um I did that, but in doing so, befriended both. I started befriending um, other artists, and there were several groups in in Houston, but in the African American community, there there were there was not for at that point existed a a, a group of, of of African American artists. So uh, George and and Big Bird and Bird Samples, we call Big Bird. And, uh, and 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 uh, Rick and Jesse and I we started meeting for lunch and dinner and and if I co recall correctly they would come to my house uh, or they or we would go to Bert's house and you know Bert was known for his cooking so uh, I would always order and <laughs> cater it in but uh, we would meet and and eat and talk and, and argue because we we had a vision that that artists need or African-American artists need to come into a, a, an area in town. We, we didn't, it wasn't, Third World wasn't targeted, but we knew we needed to go to an area that was uh, uh, not doing well. It was a ghetto. And, and it just happened that Rick saw these houses and, and uh, we decided we would, we would, we would take this as, as, as a project. I think what we all had in common was that we were either from a neighborhood like that or we were activists during the civil rights. I know I was, I got went to jail several times in Memphis. Um, um, I remember George talking about his act, act, activities uh, uh, in California and in New York. And, and so we wanted to make a point. We wanted to transform a community. We wanted to get rid of drugs. We wanted to have a wholesome environment for kids and 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 it was all about artists coming into a community and transforming it so uh the the word project row house or its title is is not as important as as these seven artists getting together with the intentions of 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 transforming an a, an area because it could have been a storefront so there had been a storefront never would have been called Project Row House. So Bert, why don't you, you know, you fill in um, your, your points about, about this. Yeah, but before I start, uh, Paul, could you share that story of how you guys went up to uh, Bert's house up in Splendora? The creation uh, of the Magnificent Seven at that point? Yeah, yeah, we were called the Magnificent Seven. I'm not sure who gave us that name. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I'm, I, uh, I, I, I grew up looking at cowboys a lot. <laughs> so 
there's this, this, you know, this old movie, Magnificent Seven. But anyway, so we went up to Bird's house um, and um, some of us had something to drink <laughs> and or we carried it with us. But Bert had a beautiful, beautiful place up there. That was, uh, that wasn't, that was Shepherd, right, Bert? Shepherd. Yeah, it's, it was close to uh, Cyrus uh, place in Splendor. Yeah, South Cyrus is, is in Splendor and that was Shepherd, Shepherd. Uh, and so we would, we went up there and uh, I, I think, did we have an argument, Bert, I believe? Oh, it was many arguments, but. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys got pulled over going up there, but it was the, the visualization of like, you know, what, 3,000 pounds or so driving up to uh, to Shepherd, you know. Uh, and uh, main, the main argument, I think, was, uh, you know, Rick was like the catalyst of initiating, but, you know, he had all these wild ideas. And uh, Jesse was like, I what I would call on the basketball court, the enforcer. And he was holding Rick down to the, all these wild stories that he, he thinks he's going to accomplish. And he was challenging them. He wasn't just challenging us. He was, uh, Rick, he was challenging all of us at the time. And the reason I wanted Paul to, to illuminate on that story is because that was where I think we first saw ourselves as a group, you know, with not knowing what we we're going to do, but that was the, the level of commitment that we, we initiated at that point. And I don't know if we actually had shown at this point at that Midtown Gallery that you organized for it. Mm -hmm. and it also included Fletcher Mackey and maybe one or two other people, mm -hmm. Smith, I think. And it was the first time I think, you know, that many African American artists was showing in the third ward area. Because up to that point, you know, the whole social structure was going to these different galleries on the west side of down the town. And each artist is networking for their own rights to do something. And then we were like not knowing each other until something like, like that had pulled us together because we were approaching some of us are mid-career, but we recognize that younger artists that came by after us, like Oda Banger Jones, they, you know, what kind of footing would they have? Because I know what it's like when I got out of, out of grad school or undergrad school. It's like, it just do just the whole uh, decades of artists that disappeared once they left school and there was no place for them to show or to do their work and it was just, you fall into a deep hole, like that image I see in that movie Get Out, where he falls into this deep hole and doesn't know how to get out of it. And so that was some of our part of our manifesto is to create an opportunity for artists to show their work, you know, in non traditional settings. And uh, so about the bonding because uh, after that we started doing a lot of other things together uh, yeah. playing basketball when you were talking right. about an enforcer <laughs> Jesse was like called Malone man when we played when we played ball yeah if uh, uh, you on track huh oh man <laughs> you you would want to be on his on his team because if you weren't you're gonna get elbowed you <laughs> you may lose a tooth you who know? <laughs> But uh, it, it really brought us together. Um, and you know, the sad part was we lost James Bettison uh, during that time. And mm -hmm. I still uh, have sad memories about, about that. But it, we, really, we really fused together. You know, when you look at this, at, at the Project Royal House right now, that, that end building where the bricks are, that was mm -hmm. a house. Right. A drug house. And I remember when we first got, when we first got there starting to renovate, I got under one of those houses. I'm not sure. I think we were trying try to take the debris out. And I had all white on for some reason. And when I came out, I saw all these little black specks on me. And what they were were fleas. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And then I started thinking, well, 
of these these are fleas, but they probably were drug needles, you know, needles from you know that were discarded. I said, oh God, man, I got to be careful. <laughs> but that, but you know, the the whole the, this 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 particular institution brought the whole community, the city. I mean, from River Oaks to uh, Memorial, wherever, everybody, every race, every every class came together uh, to help us to to unify, to transform this this area. And and, and a couple other good things, a couple other things I want to say. It was Rick. It was Rick who really was the force. And and if it had not been for Rick, Project Row House would not be what it is. And after Rick, of course, is Bert Samuels, because Bert has always been on the trustee board. But Rick, if you think about it, I mean, Rick sacrificed his career during that time. Um, but it got him a MacArthur. <laughs> and, <laughs> well and, worth and, it. Yeah. And 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 then we had these these houses for, for single women, single African American women who had kids who were on welfare. And we got all of them, and still today, we get them off of welfare where they have jobs. And one in particular got a PhD. I mean, so there are a lot of great stories from this institution that seven artists, seven African American artists started. I have one 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 thing to add about about actually about your your craft as an artist. We typically, when we think of artists, we typically think of individual sort of personal expression. And as founders of Project Row Houses, and you've just mentioned it in the context of Rick and some of the, some of the other Magnificent Sevens, you, um, you understood your position as an artist in a broader sense, as having a role to play in shaping communities and social engagement. Um, can you, if thinking back almost 30 years later, do you think that at this present moment of political protest and of social dissatisfaction, is this model, um, is this communal way of, um, of embracing art and this idea of leaning on each other more timely today than perhaps ever? Uh, I think the, the issues have never changed as far as concerned is that uh, the evolution of Project Row Houses, you know, started with us, but it also it was also the vision that John Beers, when he started painting these houses, he literally painted these houses in his, some of his compositions, and he illuminated the pride that these, these Black women had about their houses, their homes, and how they garnished them with, with beauty, outside, interior and outside, and the way that the, the expansion of the Padraza's campus expanded architecture was part of the same type of quilting pattern that John Bidders had initiated in his uh, paintings and murals. But I also want to point out in, in one of those early photographs we see where we're, we're cleaning underneath the house and rebuilding the porches. You know, we enlisted a lot of people to get that. I mean, it was literally a community effort that I think initiated before that, we got as a group, we also were forming a citywide union for artists, which we called the Union of Independent Artists. It happened a few years before that, and we were organizing rallies and protesting in front of uh, corporate buildings and, and in front of uh, medical dumping sites and things like that happened in the 60s. Uh, in, in Houston, you know, by the same uh, catalyst by young students from TSU uh, protesting, you know, dumping sites and young children drowning in, in pools of water. Uh, that, uh, that force was still coming, was still growing out for us because once we got that movement going and had getting other artists and other people's attention, you know, of, of that we are a part of this community that we and have rights and demand rights as individuals, as group of artists, then it solidified itself by establishing a physical space. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the, the, the literal campus where Rouse is, you know, back in the day, 
as my dad used to call it, that place was called the sleeve. And the sleeve was this un, it was a undeclared marking where people conducted, you know, underground business. Mm -hmm. So what you see was a courtyard between the inner parts of the blocks. The fronts of the houses were all, as you see there, and uh, the, the two stories on the, on the corner was basically a store at the, on the ground floor and a family living above, and the family was running the, the store and also collecting rent from all the houses around there. And as the city developed more stricter zoning laws and people moved further in suburbs and seemed like third world was like dying out, economically was like being bombed out. High unemployment, you know, high rates of crime, you know, mm -hmm. the things that is always associated with, you know, well, this is how they are. Well, it's a systematic process. And, you know, being artists, and we were not cognizant of all these different issues, how they evolved, but we came to grips with all these issues and having being artists trying to find creative solutions, helping people solve issues in their own homes, which yeah. endeared us to the neighborhood because we were, we were bringing a certain type of beauty like these, these African women, women, women were doing in their own interiors of their homes. Yeah. So it's the potential for the neighborhood, but also the potential for their own lives in a way as an extension of, of that neighborhood and that collective experience. And these are just some images of where Project How Row Houses is now. And it's just, um, I really encourage everyone to, to spend some time when, when, when we are able to go back over there um, to really experience the, the, heart, the beating heart of Houston. Um, I wanted to begin opening it up for questions, uh, but I did have one last question to ask, and it kind of ties into some of the questions that I am filtering and reading um, on the chat box. And the question is as follows. So both of you have had very successful parallel careers um, in education, Floyd, and also in conservation, Bert, alongside your art practices. Could you talk a little bit about, um, about that experience or more than that, about how you've defined the idea of success as an artist through those um, parallel trajectories? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I married, I've been married to the same one for 40, almost 48 years, my lovely wife, Janice. And, and so when we were in, when we were in graduate school, I, I, I said to myself, well, I got to get a job. Um, Cause I was a little nervous about just being an artist. And um, uh, so I pursued, you know, tr trying to get a teaching job and so I've always had a focus on, on, on being an artist, but I need to know, you know, what, what could I do that would not interfere with me creating art? And so I, I thought teaching would do that. And, and so a lot of, a lot of artists, uh, Joseph Bar Al Alberts, uh, Lippenstein, Kerry James Marshall, uh, Romare Beard and, um, uh, 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 Jacob Lawrence, John Biggers, all were teachers, you know, and, and so for me, teaching at a university was, was, was uh, my, my way. And I think about Sam Gillian, I think Sam Gillian, mm -hmm. and uh, I think worked in, in, a, in a public school setting, not, and not a university. But uh, teaching allowed me to to uh, share thoughts and help uh, direct students and to nurture them, and at the same time gave me time to to be creative. So those two things really work together for me. I, and that's what I'm still teaching, although it, it's going to soon soon end. But um, um, I, I made sure that I would I had a regiment that that uh, I, I would adhere to so that neither of the two would suffer. 
What about you, Bert? Uh, I find myself, uh, my career is almost extremely frustrating. Um, I think, you know, by me studying art at TSU, which was a program initially solely of creating art educators, training uh, young people to teach art at different levels uh, to students in small towns and people around the South in Texas. And then, you know, to teach them also to be an artist in their spare time. But I also had to convince my family if I was going to go and, and go to a grid art that I could support myself. So, which meant is that, you know, I was fortunate to get certain type of fellowship programs, uh, scholarship credit, and then I had to lock down a job, and that's where I've been ever since. And just the demands of what the job has initiated it's limited my way of how I'll be working as an artist, but it created opportunities I didn't think I would have. Uh, and so um, the things that we've been talking about in terms of the merits of our work was done after I had lost my studio. You know, I didn't have a student at the time when these works were being created. And so it forced me to think out of, a, out of the box in a way that most artists are not comfortable doing. And I always said to myself, the common attitude I have with artists and other, other people, uh, particularly in dire straits, is that the creative process is, is a desperate act. And you have to, you find some way to get something going if your life if you feel your life depends on. It. And uh, so that's always been I've been at the crux of my, you know, creativity and work and just forcing me on the right path and to run to become friends with Floyd and Jesse and Rick and Jesse and George, you know, and getting to know them. Spending a lot of time getting the artists in the, in the community and finding the same issues that I've been suffering, they've been dealing with, and learning sometimes together how we can overcome these these uh, these problems. So, so I have a question from from one participant, from Sarah, and she is asking, and you've already both kind of hinted at it a little bit but um, you are both well-recognized artists with long established careers at major Houston institutions. What advice can you give to other artists, particularly those who have um, just recently graduated or are starting out? What, other, what advice can you give them um, in terms of seeking to work and produce art successfully? What is your takeaway from your long experience? Well, I, I've always um, been a very passionate person and refused to, to accept no's uh, or rejections. So I think for students uh, today, they should be determined uh, to, to succeed even when, when, when they get uh, a no. Um, they first of all should prepare themselves for for a career if they're going to be an artist um, and in preparing themselves they they should have options they should they should you know the option one could be to teach option two could be to work in a museum and as as bert does uh, uh i have a friend in new york that worked uh in the theater and 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 so you've got to have a game plan but you also got to have the the faith that that you you can't be uh, denied. Um, uh, Alice Alice Neal didn't have her major show until she was mm -hmm. years old at the Whitney. So I always I always uh, get strength by knowing history of, of 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 art and artists. And when I can when I get about getting down about something, I just refer to to history, and 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 I use. Uh, others uh experiences to motivate me because for an artist if if you get defeated on on because you, you get rejections then then you have not you, you 
actually have given up and and you don't know the next day you could have made it and that's what happens you you know for anyone in any career um you have to understand that that sometimes uh, a no or a rejection is a learning a learning experience so i motivate my students to realize that whatever they're going to go through or where they're going through right now it's it's a part of life it's a part of life it's a part of character building and so uh you should never uh allow hard times to define define you but they should other than to build you up and so i i, I first tell my students to be prepared you know uh, learn their craft well and continue to learn because uh, uh just just thinking about that when i went went to get my master's at Bar Temple University, uh, I became an apprentice under two professors, and I would get teased because the students would say, "Well, man, you're, in, you're getting a, a master's; you don't need to be an apprentice." I said, "The operative word is school. I'm still in school, and I was taught by those two professors things that they did they did not teach in the classroom." And so I, I encourage students to to seek out, you know, uh, a mentor. Uh, to make sure that you know that that um, they are equipped, you know, to to do a noble job. And um, I think that 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 being equipped means that that uh, beyond your just getting a degree. You need to have um, have the kind of stamina to 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 work through you know any particular problems that 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 you may you may be confronted with. So working at University of Houston downtown for these forty four years, it has allowed me to meet a lot of students. It, it gave it, it 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 gave me an opportunity to be uh, a a sort of an ambassador to the arts because a lot of my students did not major in art but what i created in them uh, a sense of art that art was was valuable and art was something that could help them in 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 life experiences and that i have many emails from 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 students uh, uh from the past that that talk about uh or speak to the to the, to the fact that they were happy they were delighted that they took my class and that uh, they are they're still going to the museums and some are still drawing or painting um, and that it was therapeutic for them because some of them end up being doctors or whatever so uh, uh, working uh, at, at university of Houston downtown has been uh, a pleasure and it's been uh, a way of motivating first generation first generation students which i'm, I'm kind of considered one myself to uh, prevail over any obstacle um, yeah, I think uh, I think Lord said it all for me. Actually, I mean, being in position as an artist, but uh, more important as what he illustrated as a teacher, he can illuminate you know the potential that we all have in each other. And my word of advisement to everyone is. Keep your eyes open, keep them wide open because there's opportunities around you. And we're living through a lot of depressing moments right now, you know. But I was thinking back when I came to the tissue, and there was no opportunity for, for being an artist in any form of circumstance, but yet there were evidence of sequence of that happening around us. And I think of how. Dr. Bigger's career had evolved. And I'm also thinking of my friend and mentor as well, Carmen Oliver, who's in, internationally known as well. But even as of today, he, sent, he still works at the post office. Mm -hmm. You know, he has a very humble sense of himself, but he's, he does amazing, amazing, incredible things with his work but he recognizes of what 
he is and what he wants to do. And he doesn't let anything move him away from that. I find that extremely inspirational. Uh, not being a teacher, but being at the museum, I've been able to see as many great of art, great art and artists that never started off as an artist. At some point, their life shifted where that became the most essential thing for them. And how did they get to that point is somewhat is, is a mystery. But to, at that point, to make that conviction, to continue to, to work hard. And many of them, and some of the most internationally known artists that we ever know, never saw themselves as an artist and even considered themselves a fave because they never saw not one artwork, not one. And yet their work is being valued around around the world sometimes. So there's many roads to lead to be an artist, but it depends on what feeds your soul, I guess, what I say. And that's just keep feeding whatever that is. And if you have any creative juices, those things will come out, but have faith. Thank, thank you both. I think we all, you pro I'll probably be joined by everyone who's here listening. I think we all in one way or another needed to hear that, even though we may not be artists ourselves. Thank you. Um, I'd like to end with one last question from, from Douglas, who says that he's heard you both describe artists as people who connect other people and ideas and who are in the service of others. At what point in your lives did that register for both of you? The question is, is, is how, when did we recognize that we were artists and how we could serve others, is that correct? How, yes, how those book concerns sort of merged in, into one, how art and community merged. Yeah. I, I have an interesting story. Um, I've always knew I was gonna be an artist. And my wife uh, told me, in, in, I think it was 2001, 2002, my mother in 1995 told my wife that she knew I was going to be an artist when I was four years old. So I guess I was drawn on the walls. But I, I've always known I was going to be an artist. But as a servant, I recall a, a neighbor of mine and I were walking home from school and there was a fight. And one guy was really beating up the other guy. And so we just stopped the fight. We didn't side. We stopped and made sure that the fight was had ended. And at that point, I, I really in my gut felt I was I was I was a servant. And so um, uh, and that's why I think all of us got together with, Pro, with for Project Row House and other things that we do even beyond Project Row House. Uh, and artists. Uh, there are two things that I am. I'm an artist and a, and a servant. Actually, I have a nickname, or I, I call myself an ass, an artist social servant. <laughs> but, uh, 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 and, and that's, a, that's an ass in a good way. If you look at the Bible, uh, you'll find out that, that the donkey, the ass, has done a lot of good things. But, uh, but uh, I, uh, I feel that artists perform uh, noble, uh, 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 noble things that, that, that help to contribute making society more valuable. Uh, it's art can be therapeutic art and artists when they are engaged in their creative work, whether it is realistic or abstract, it gives an, an audience an opportunity to, to escape the real world. And so uh, uh, the most important thing I think in life is, is to find your passion. And in that passion, you should give back. And if you're giving back, that means you're helping society. You're helping society to, to uh, maintain stability, you, uh, a sense of worth. Uh, uh, you, 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 you motivate people. So, being an artist and a servant, they, they, one never uh, is over the other. For me, they are they're equal.
But yeah, I think I feel grateful that I got to know Floyd and Jesse and, and Rick and George. George also was a great educator, is, is a great educator and has a great passion for music and, you know, has been in part of a lot of revolutionary movements. And I want to also illuminate the point that when most people hear the word artist in the abstract, it's probably defined as some individual working in their studio alone, unknown, brooding, worried, agitated about something, and but no one knows and no one cares. They're just in that space. Yeah. And I think we changed the paradigm of or at least part of the paradigm that, you know, we have to look beyond ourselves. Is that as human beings we have to uh, we have to work, we can't work alone. And that's probably the downfall or detriment of the society that, you know, there's this element of individualism and and freedom. But, you know, black folks always relied on each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have nothing but rags, you know, and cardboard and and no shoes. And how you get from here to there, you know. You know, there's no answer for that. You know, you just have to rely on each other and like Floyd and straight in the fight, you don't leave no one behind. And I think that's what's happening in this movement. All of a sudden there's a spark in a in a generation that's slowly being identified as you can't let these people die alone. They their lives to be more than just, you know, uh, a hit on someone's uh, video or tweet, tweet, you know, we got to be more than that. Um, we got to give our lives more substance, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and just follow up with, with real work. Find ways of applying how we can um, not leave anyone else behind. I think that's a great life lesson that we can that we can look to in our own lives and find ways of, of integrating that into our way of living. Thank you, thank you both so much. This was illuminating and inspiring and I'm getting a lot of comments from participants along those lines. They profoundly enjoyed it. Thank you. For our participants, I wanted to let you know that we're gonna um, launch a short feedback um, opportunity. And if you could, humor us and, and complete that. We would greatly appreciate it for, for everyone who joined. Know that this is our fourth um, in, in a series of five artist conversations. So stay tuned for our fifth and final one coming up in September, last week in September. And that one will focus on some of the art that is on display at the University of Houston in Clear Lake. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you again, Bert and Floyd, for making this happen, even despite of a hurricane Laura coming coming our way, or hopefully, hopefully veering a little bit to to further east. But um, thank you both. Thank you both thank so you much, and us. have a blessed day, everyone. And thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to see you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.